special welcome to the Dean of the Schools of Arts and Sciences, Peter Starr, and also to my colleague, Dan Arbel, the former Deputy Ambassador of Israel here in Washington. And I also want to thank the Women in Politics Institute at the, school, uh, at the school of Public Affairs under the leadership of Betsy Fisher-Martin, who is here tonight for co-sponsoring this lecture, and as always, our Managing Director, Laura Cutler, for all the efforts that went into preparing this event. As we are still celebrating the 20th anniversary of our Center for Israel Studies, this academic year, we choose a specific theme um, for these weeks, women in Israeli politics. Last week, we listened to a wonderful lecture on Golda Meir by Francine Klagsbrun, her biographer. Golda was, of course, the first woman to serve as foreign minister and the first female prime minister worldwide, well, who did not follow a father or spouse in the office, I should say. But how is the situation today? The number of women in the Knesset is at an all high with 33 out of 120. It makes it 27% of all members of the parliament, which is not so high compared to many European countries, but very high compared to the mere 17% of women represented in the US Congress. When you look at cabinet positions, however, the number of women in Israel is low. And when you look at the top candidates of the two major parties competing for next, the next Knesset being elected in two weeks, um, the number is also very far from equal. At the same time, the recent municipal elections showed a success for some women, especially um, for the race of mayor in Haifa, which now has the first female mayor. So where are we today when it comes to women in Israeli politics? We have with us a, an expert and an insider to discuss this question. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Enat Wilf, who, is, who comes to us from Israel, who was a Knesset member from 2010 to 2013 on behalf of the labor and independent parties. Born and raised in Israel, Dr. Wilf served as an intelligence officer in the Israeli Defense Forces, and her past experience includes service as the chair of the Education, Sports, and Culture Committee, chair of the Knesset Subcommittee for Israel and the Jewish People, and member of the influential Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee in the 18th Knesset. Einat Wilf holds a bachelor's degree in government and fine arts from Harvard University, an MBA from INSAD in France, and a PhD in political science from the University of Cambridge. She's the author of six books. Uh, she just told me the latest one, which is only out in Hebrew so far, is coming out with Macmillan in English. It's on the um, issue of Palestinian refugees return and the problems uh, that go along with it. She is also an original thinker on matters of foreign policy, economics, education, and in international issues. She is considered one of Israel's most articulate representative on the international stage with her opinion articles regularly published in international publications and frequent interviews for television and radio programs around the world, and she was also considered as, the, as Israel's UN ambassador. I should also mention that she was a foreign policy advisor to Shimon Peres when he was vice prime minister, and it was Shimon Peres who inaugurated our Center for Israel Studies in 1998, 1998 actually as the first Center for Israel Studies worldwide. I'm also happy to welcome back with us our moderator for tonight, Dr. Tamara Vitis, who many of you may remember when here in the same room, probably in the same chairs, she led a discussion with former Israeli ambassador Michael Oren. Tamara Kaufman-Wittes is a senior fellow in the Center for Middle East 
policy at Brookings. She served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs from November 2009 to 2012, coordinating U.S. policy on democracy and human rights in the Middle East in the middle of the Arab uprising. Wittes also oversaw the Middle East Partnership Initiative and served as Deputy Special Coordinator for Middle East Transitions. Before joining Brookings in December of 2003, she served as a Middle East Specialist at the U.S. Institute of Peace and Director of Programs at the Middle East Institute in Washington. And in her biography, too, there is a relationship to Shimon Peres. Wittes was one of the first recipients of the Rabin Peres Peace Award established by President Bill Clinton in 1997. Tamara Wittes holds a bachelor's degree in Judaic and Near Eastern Studies from Oberlin and a master's and doctorate in government from Georgetown University. She's the author of several books. Her current research is for a forthcoming book on the tangled history of America's ties to autocratic allies. Looking forward to this one. And please join me in wel welcoming both Inat Wilf and Tamara Wittes. Thank you very much for this very well, warm welcome, and it's a true uh, pleasure uh, being here. And I look very much forward to our conversation and discussion later. Uh, I will open with a few descriptions and remarks regarding the life of women and women in politics in Israel. So I think that if we want to understand in general the life of women or the position of women in Israel is to think that women in Israel inhabit or live in three different centuries. The first centuries, the first century that women live in is the 21st century. Indeed, women in Israel very much face many of the same dilemmas that women face in Western, advanced, developed countries in the 21st centuries. You could say that in many ways, if the 20th century was about the advancement of women towards rights and equality, the 21st century is very much about the rise of women to power, to positions of power, at the top, in business, in politics, throughout society, and that's a process that takes time. In that sense, Israel and women in Israel are very much of the 21st century. As Dr. Brenner mentioned, our numbers are decent. They're not as good as the numbers of Scandinavian countries, but literally no one has the numbers of Scandinavian countries. Uh, they're now worried about representation for men in their parliament. So we're not there yet. But Israel is in a fairly decent position. The outgoing Knesset has nearly a third of its members uh, female. This is above even now after the entry of a strong female freshman class. Even now it's above both uh, parts or both uh, houses of the US Congress, still better than Canada, the UK, France. So fairly decent in terms of the representation in a decent place. Uh, the role of women in boards, in the economy, which in all countries, by the way, is not as good as it is in politics, still puts us in a decent place among the world's most advanced nations. And in that sense, women in Israel and women in politics in Israel are of the 21st century. Also, the dilemmas of women across Israeli society are very much those that, at least uh, a few years ago, were very much uh, dominant in the discourse. The questions between Anne-Marie Slaughter, can women have it all? the questions of Sheryl Sandberg, of leaning in, of how to have power. These are very much the dilemmas of women in Israel 
how to balance careers, aspirations to power with family life, uh, with the difference, of course, that at least in Israel, uh, at least a certain or a large proportion of family life is supported, public education, primary education, uh, even on the question of reproductive rights, fertility rights. If you know anything about Israel, I sometimes joke that in Israel we don't have reproductive rights, we have reproductive duties. Uh, but, uh, but as a result, Israel is one of the world's most advanced countries in terms of the provision of health care and fertility and support for women, for families. Israel actually is the world, is number one in the world in the ratio of working mothers of three. Oh, it's an interesting statistic and it actually says a lot because in much of the world, you actually don't have mothers of three in the Western world. And if you have mothers of three, they tend not to work. Uh, so in Israel, Israel happens to be number one in working number in wor working mothers of three, because three, and this is the number of my children, is considered very much the bare minimum, and one is very much expected to continue to be a mother and a working mother, even with three children. But still, the dilemmas are very much the same that women in advanced countries in the 21st century will recognize and Israeli women have them just the same with the particular obsession of Israel with family and children. So that's generally the 21st century. The other century that women in Israel inhabit is the 20th century. We still have, and I don't think we're very unique in that, we still continue to suffer from a hangover of the 20th century. What does it mean? The idea of equality. So the idea of equality is accepted, but is far from fully implemented. Of course, we are yet to arrive at equal pay for equal work, and despite tremendous advancements in the economy, in academia, in politics, there is still a way to go to get to that uh, equality. Uh, sexual harassment, for example. Israel has some of the most advanced laws on sexual harassment, but as I'm sure you know, it takes a while to get from the legal perspective to the social norms. And Israel is still working hard on the social norms of sexual harassment. And again, in that sense, I don't think we're unique. Me Too has emerged from this country to sweep the world, uh, and we have had especially to work on that issue in the context of the Israeli military, which again has made tremendous strides in being a military that is very aware of the idea of sexual harassment, but there is still work to be done to make the social norms uh, on par with the legal reality. So this is the second century that women in Israel inhabit, the, over, the hangover from the 20th century. And then, which perhaps is a little more unique, but not completely to Israel, is women in Israel inhabit the 10th century. And that comes uh, in a variety of forms. First, it's very relevant to the two large minorities within Israeli society. Minorities that together form a third of Israeli society, so not so small. Those include what we call the ultra-Orthodox or the Haredi Jews and Israel's Arab minority. What characterizes both of these minorities is that each, for its own reasons and historical development, were not part of the mainstay of the historical secular Zionist development of the state of Israel, and were essentially brought into Israeli society and Israeli democracy with the establishment of the state, but they were not part 
of the group that built it, created it, and shaped its rules. Now, first on the ultra-Orthodox Jews. Uh, one of the interesting things in general about Haredi Jews, uh, I don't know if you've ever wondered about their fashion choice. We often, uh, this is how sometimes people think about Jews, the black clad. These were, cho these were clothes that were very popular in Poland in the 17th century. And the fashion choice is actually um, a statement about the place and time that they want to freeze. It is a movement based on the idea that as the walls came down in Europe, they, with emancipation, they are bringing the walls up. This is why Haredi Jews in America, for example, will amass in large numbers in Madison Square Garden to protest not anti-Semitism, for example, but the internet. Because the internet is a threat, because the internet brings down walls. So it is a community that is based on creating walls at a time when the walls have been brought down. As a result, in a way that is almost counterintuitive, it is actually a modern creation. We think of it as a traditional creation, but it is actually a modern one because it is a response to modernity. It is the outcome of an effort to respond to a modern challenge to Jewish life, the challenge of the bringing down of the walls. And one of the ways in which these walls are kept up is by preserving a certain role for women. And sometimes in even creating new traditions becoming more extreme about the role of women in order to preserve these invisible walls. Now here this is, and this will be the same for the Arab minority, this is where two liberal values clash. Uh, the value of feminism, a strong liberal value, and the more recent liberal value of multiculturalism. And this is something that is not unique to Israel. It happens uh, increasingly in some European societies that have some more traditional minorities, where the idea is this. If we accept the multicultural creed that all cultures, all systems are equally valid, equally worthy of respect, and that there's no hierarchy, and that there's no judgment, what do you do with the liberal value of feminism. When some cultures claim that their culture, it is in their culture to have a particular place for a woman. The dilemma becomes even stronger when the woman herself says that. And that is where many feminist women find themselves torn. Can you tell a woman that she has, as we sometimes call it, false consciousness? That when she tells you that she wants the buses to be separated, that she feels better, she feels more respected if she sits at the back of the bus, can you tell her that she's wrong? Can you tell her that she doesn't know what she's thinking? How does that square with the feminist value of respecting a woman's ability to think and speak for herself? Not simple. And here is where Israel indeed finds itself in deep dilemma. This is a substantial minority that claims that this is a value. And the problem that Israel has found is the question of where does respect end? Because for example, and this is something we're dealing with on a daily basis, they will say, Haredis, that they find it offensive to see images of women in the public space. They will actually vandalize uh, large signs on buses, different places that have women in them. And not thinly clad women for deodorant commercials, 
but women in politics. You will have ads for political parties that will not have women on them if it is in areas where uh, Haredis tend to live. Is that legitimate? These things go to our Supreme Court. At what point do we respect the value? At what point does it go against our fundamental values of feminism and equality of men and women? And this is literally a daily dilemma. The other large minority is the Arab minority, which by and large is still, uh, despite some uh, notable uh, um, exceptions, is a traditional patriarchal rural society. Now, one of the most incredible kind of dilemmas really comes in the most traditional and rural of that societies, the Arab Bedouins, the nomadic tribes. Now, in Bedouin society, polygamy is the norm. I can assure you that polygamy in Israel is outlawed. So what do you do? And this is what happens. Bedouin men marry women. They will have two, three children with one woman, and then they will divorce her. Now, there is no law, even in very modern countries, that tells a divorced woman what she can or cannot do with her ex-husband. So these divorced women continue to live next to their hus ex-husbands. The ex-husband marries a new woman. She lives with him bears a few children, and so on and so on. And what you have here is polygamy meeting the welfare state, because these women are now single mothers who enjoy the benefits of the relatively generous Israeli welfare state. So you have a confluence of a modern welfare state with the multicultural sensitivity, but as a result, real women and girls are hurt by the continued practice of polygamy in a traditional society. And again, the question is, how far to intervene? Do you enter into the Bedouin villages and what? Take the women away? How do you deal with that? Where does respect end? Where do you begin to enforce the values of feminism, of equality, of men and women? And more broadly for the general society, Israel still continues to outsource and give a monopoly to religious establishments, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim. Israel actually has Sharia law uh, to govern personal matters of marriage, divorce, burial. And as a result, completely modern, secular women often find themselves subjected to medieval customs when it comes to marriage, divorce, and burial. And much of the kind of rebellion against that takes place as a quiet rebellion. Sometimes, as a member of parliament, you are confounded by the fact that, you can, that numbers don't make sense. You say, okay, the vast majority of the Israeli public doesn't want religious authorities to govern these personal matters. So how is it that the majority fails to have its way? It's an excellent political question always. Because majorities are actually irrelevant in politics, and they're irrelevant in democratic politics. What matters is the extent to which groups are devoted to an idea and the extent to which the majority truly cares or is angry about it. So imagine a secular couple about to be married. First of all, they have a way around it. They can decide Israel has a form of contract union. They can go that way. But let's say they want a proper marriage. When before they're married, when they're single, 
the last thing they care about in the world is fighting the religious establishment, right? They're single people. It's not exactly on their agenda. Then they found the one. They're going to get married. They're busy choosing a DJ and the color of the napkins. They're not going to start fighting the rabbinate in the few months until their wedding. So they're going to be like, OK, we'll just go through the motions, find a normal enough rabbi, and end that story. And once they're married, they certainly are not going to spend any time on it because they're married. They're done. So it's not just about the numbers. If you ask people passively, yes, they don't want that. But when you actually need to mobilize politically to change that, you find very few troops. So this is the situation in Israel. So to understand women more broadly is, and that's why it's sometimes confusing, you will go and see Israel and meet women, and you will be like, I see that. That's, that looks familiar. This is the 21st century. You will also recognize the hangover of the 20th century, which is still very common in your country. And then, perhaps less familiar and more befuddling and confusing will be the fact that we still, in some aspects, and for some women more than others, live in the 10th century under medieval ideas. So this is where we are. This is what shapes Israeli politics, Israeli women, the role of women in Israeli politics. And I'm more than happy to take it now to discussion. Thank you. Well, Enad, thank you. That was a fantastic overview and a really fascinating framework for our conversation. Um, I want to get to a number of the issues that you raised, particularly about these 10th century problems. Um, but before we get to the policy and the political, I want to start with the personal. Because um, I think all of us operating as women in the public sphere, uh, develop our views, but we also have our own experiences that shape our views. So I, I'd like to give our audience a little bit of insight into your personal experience. So your time in the military was in a pretty elite unit. Unit 8200, for those of you who don't know, is the uh, intelligence unit of the Israeli army. It is now the high-tech intelligence unit of the Israeli army. And uh, mili the how you spend your time in the military for many people is the network that you use to start your career. These are the people who are your friends for, for much of the rest of your life. Um, and it shapes, it shapes your trajectory. And 8200 is usually a great place to jump off from. Um, you mentioned that there's a difference between the laws and the norms, even within the military, when it comes to treatment of women and men. So I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about your experience as a woman in this elite intelligence unit, how that felt. Did you feel that gap between norms and rules? So um, first, I have to give a bit of a background on my own kind of personal development. Sometimes um, young women, or th they want to ask, you know, how did I kind of learn to have the courage to speak up and to be confident? And I always have to disappoint them by saying that I have no tale of hardship because from a very young age, and I think in that sense, uh, fathers matter a lot. So to all you young fathers here or new young fathers one day, it matters a lot. My father had invested a lot of me and had, you know, I have a younger brother. There was never a sense that there's more expected of him 
than of me, and really my father always had very kind of high expectations and invested in me, and I was that annoying kid in school who would raise her hand for every question <laughs> that the teacher would have to say, can someone other than a not please speak up? And uh, <laughs> I'm so, shocked to learn that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so in that sense, I did grow up with a kind of very quiet sense of confidence, and in many ways I have to say my feminism developed much, much later, my feminist consciousness, because I did grow up with the sense of like, there's no problem. And in many ways my military service continued that sense of like, everything is cool, because as you said, it was an elite unit, a third of the recruits were women, two thirds were men, but still it wasn't like 10%, it was a third, two thirds, so still okay of very smart women, very smart men, and it was all about the brains. There was no need for any physical work. This was intelligence work. Uh, so I was able to be in a military environment which was relatively egalitarian. I became an officer, I went to officer's training. When it began to change actually is that at the time they had a rule that women who were officers will not serve in the reserve. And men continue to serve in the reserve. And you talked about networks. A lot of the networks were actually preserved through the continuous and repeated and frequent reserve service. A lot of the high-tech units, high-tech companies that come from 8200 emerge from that camaraderie and at least, and one of the things I started to fight against it because I was very annoyed that they are giving up on me. I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't think I've contributed anything less. And uh, so this was the first time. I mean, up until that moment, nothing that I really encountered. But from that, that was really blatant and very annoying. Uh, and I fought against it. I think by, by now they've changed the policy. But even here, I was still relatively spared being in a unit that was generally men and women judged by their brain power, which was, in that sense, a very egalitarian environment. Wonderful, thank you. So, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you tend to describe yourself as an atheist. Is that right? Absolutely true. Okay. And a devout one. A devout atheist. Yes. We can debate whether that's a, a contradiction in terms. That's a good philosophical question. Um, and we will get into a little bit later the role of the chief rabbinate in Israel and the, the sort of issue of the relationship between religion and state, which you referred to in your remarks. But can you first tell us a little bit about how your atheism and your feminism relate to one another? Um, so, in general, my, my Twitter handle, which is here, I think says, feminist, Zionist, atheist, yes. <laughs> uh, and all of these three identities that are very central to me and my work, essentially emerge from the Enlightenment and from the modern revolution, and from the idea that you can question millennia-old structures. And in many ways, the idea of Jews being on a lower rung, the idea of women being on a lower rung, were part of the idea of divinely ordained hierarchies. That was very central to the pre-modern society. A pre-modern society is a divinely ordained hierarchy, and knowing your place is part of being a good member of that society. The idea of human equality is a revolution, one which we are still working on. Uh, but we take it for granted today, it's so against 10,000 years of human agricultural history. So for me, being a feminist, being an atheist, these, these are all outcomes of the Enlightenment, essentially. So you would say you're a child of the 18th century? <laughs> Always wanted those dresses. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in the time be when you got into politics, uh, you ran with a party, um, but before you actually were able to enter the Knesset, you made another race 
to be the head of the World Jewish Congress. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you about this because your candidacy actually created quite a debate really? about women and men in the leadership of Jewish organizations and about generational transition because you were running, it was a, a race to replace a man who was of an older generation and had been in the job a long time and you were running against two older men. Yes. Um, now in the United States, in the Jewish community, we've also had a very robust debate over the last few years about leadership of our Jewish organizations, generational change and the how few women are leading Jewish organizations in the United States. So I, I wonder what you took away from that experience um, and how it shaped you when you then did enter the Knesset. So first I had a lot of fun with it uh, <laughs> because, you know, we were young and challenged the authority and the establishment and it was fun and not that I thought that I would win, but it was an opportunity and a platform for our ideas for the Jewish world uh, and all that. Uh, and I, you know, uh, I think it was Ronald Lauder who approached me to remove my candidacy and all that. And, and uh, he ultimately won that election. Of course, yeah. and he would have won it anyway. <laughs> but, uh, but I kind of regret that I did that. You know, it would have been nice to go all the way. And uh, so I think I, I regret that and I do take that with me. But it also taught me a lot, and it's something that I saw later in politics and has informed a lot of my thinking on feminism in general, is um, I say that I had a short political career, but it was long enough to learn the one lesson of politics, the only lesson that really matters, and that, that no one ever gives up power voluntarily, which is basically in the nature of power. And this is sometimes something that we don't understand when as women or as Jews or as any minority or group, we fight for equality and we don't understand why it's resisted. Why, how is it that since our values are already those of equality, how is it that society doesn't already look like what we know should be the case? Why is it not happening? And I've noticed this, for example, in politics. In the Israeli parliament, there's 120 members. Now, I know maybe in the business school here or to your students or when we teach children, we try to teach them that there are win-win situations and try to get to win-win outcomes and there's win-win. Well, in politics, it's win-lose. And there's no way around it. You can be as nice as you want, but at the end of the day, there's 120 seats. If one person gets in, another person doesn't get in. If there's no way to sugarcoat it. There's just no way. So you can have incredibly feminist men, really, but they're not gonna commit political suicide. It's as simple as that. If supporting measures to have increased representation of women will make their political life harder, they're not gonna do it. Okay, so we actually have just seen an example of this play out in practice with the formation of this blue-white coalition, uh, which is now the uh, leading competition to Likud in the Israeli elections that will be held on April 9th. Uh, blue-white um, rooted its strength in three former IDF chiefs of staff, all uh, guys, guys yes. gather. Yes. Um, and Yair Lapid, who is a giver of a different type, uh, the kind of black t-shirt, you know, spends a lot of time at the gym yes. kind of giver. Um, and this party is almost empty of women candidates. Uh, I wonder how that, how is, it, well, first of all, how did that happen? <laughs> Did they suffer any backlash from it at all? Uh, and do you think it, it tells us that maybe Israeli society is a little further back on this issue than we might have hoped? So first, one of the things, because of my, have, I've seen this dynamic of power, it really uh, made me aware that even when we have gains, as Jews, as women, as any group, the notion that these gains are secure is a very dangerous notion. 
power structures always try to reassert themselves. So whatever gains are made uh, by feminists, they need to be continuously fought for. You have to hold the line. Not a, you, you actually, only by advancing do you have any chance of holding the line. So I'm very much aware that progress is not self-sustaining. You continuously have to fight for it. You continuously have to push it. And so I'm at once depressed, but I'm aware that this happens. There's a back and forth. It's not a straight line of like, okay, from now on we can count on there being more women in parliament and being more women in cabinet, and it's just gonna be a straight line. And I think this is not only just an Israeli moment, there's a, big, a bit of a global moment of like pushing back on the feminist revolution and guys in power and so, it's something that has been very annoying for me, and I am going to vote for blue and white, but the backlash has not been sufficient. And in many ways, you could argue that under the current circumstances, the only way that you could have an opposition to Netanyahu is put three guys on the other three side. Three generals three on three the generals other side. On the other side, but Yes, it's, uh, it's part of the understanding that it's not direct, smooth progress. Um, so let me turn to another dimension of women in Israeli politics. You spent uh, a portion of your remarks talking about the dynamics within the Haredi community and within the Arab sector. And one of the things I find very interesting when I look at Israeli uh, domestic society and politics is the way is how quickly those sectors are changing in their relationship to the rest of Israeli society. And, you know, um, in the Arab sector, uh, I think labor force participation for men is now above 75%. And in fact, some sectors, pharmacists and doctors and so on, are increasingly uh, dominated by uh, folks from the Arab community. Uh, whereas women have been lagging in their participation in the economy from the Arab community. In the Haredi community, of course, it's different because there is this norm that men stay in yeshiva, study Torah, and don't work full time. And the, men, the women then go out and support their families. So in the Haredi community, labor force participation for women is 75%. And for men, it's, it's more, I think it's below 50%. But the pressure, the economic pressure on these communities, even with the state welfare system, is such that it's driving more and more women, especially into the workforce. Um, I wonder, you know, do you see over time that that's gonna change some of the dynamics that you were describing about the way men in these patriarchal cultures, uh, and women also, restrict women to a particular place? Do you think that the economic participation and the economic role women are playing will empower them within their communities? So again, this is part of the back and forth of progress and backlash. Because like you said, in the Haredi community, women work. And it seems very feminist. Women go out and they work and they're no longer just teachers, they're now uh, coders and lawyers and accountants. But it's until you understand that in that society, the learned man who stays at home is held up as the model and the woman working is actually a way of serving that man. Uh, which sometimes is confusing because we're used to thinking of a, as a working woman as a feminist achievement. Yeah. Uh, but you're right that women having economic power has an impact on that society. And in many ways, some of the measures to be more extreme with respect to the role of women are a backlash against some of those advances. And it's this back and forth dynamic, uh, but you have women who claim to be Haredi feminists who are trying to 
speak for feminism from Jewish law and scriptures and to make the case for feminism from that. So it's a dynamic that I want to hope will lead in one direction, but I've learned not to bet on it. There's a lot of the back and forth there. There, there was even, I think, a Haredi women's group that sued uh, Agudat Yisrael, one of the ultra-Orthodox parties, uh, because they had a bylaw that said only men may compete for the Knesset on our list. And they took them to the high court, and I think they won the case, did they not? Um, I don't think, uh, I'm I not sure, actually. So, if I remember right, Agudat Israel agreed that they would remove that clause, but they okay. still have the Council of Rabbis oh, okay. decide yes, who yes. to run, so it's okay. Yes. No women will be allowed to run, exactly. but it's not officially it's not official, yeah, okay. men only. Um, so these Haredi feminists, yes. some of them are pushing for political representation within the Haredi community, yes. and obviously finding obstacles there. Um, we also had in this year's election, briefly, a new party headed by a Haredi woman, Adina Bar Shalom, that was not competing for the Haredi vote. It was yeah. competing more broadly, trying to appeal to Israelis across the spectrum. Now, for those of you who don't know, Adina Bar Shalom is the daughter of the former Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel. So she's from Haredi royalty, in essence. Uh, and she's been very outspoken for women's education, women's participation in the workforce, and she decided to form a party with non-Haredi to run for Knesset. Now, ultimately, they couldn't get money, they pulled out of the race, they're not running. Do you think that there are possibilities, though, for coalitions uh, between these divides that you described, between the 10th century, if you will, and the 21st century in Israel? Well, first of all, there's no doubt that especially the Haredi Ashkenazi party is the, the really the most extreme stronghold of anti kind of keeping women. And it's always done with, it's the women who don't want power. It's the women who don't want to they run. They prefer right. to stay home. They prefer to stay home. That's always the argument. Uh, and Adina Bar Shalom comes from the Sephardi side, and there's no doubt that if we're going to see change, it's going to be first there. That's for sure. But in general, in order to understand women in Israeli politics, it's important to know that there, in Israel, there's really no such thing as the woman vote or the women's vote. You cannot look at parties or candidates and say, okay, they are favored by women. Generally, your identity of, as a woman tends to not have any political effect, which is also what, uh, you know, uh, uh, has impact on other things. But so you will have women in every party. And for some people, it makes no sense. You're going to have very right wing women. You're going to have settler women, women who support the right wing settlement project. And for some people, that doesn't make sense because if, and they will consider themselves feminists. But for some people, it doesn't make sense because if you're a feminist, you're supposed to be left wing and you're supposed to oppose uh, the settlements. And so in Israel, you will find women across the entire political spectrum, which is still dominated by questions of security and the conflict. But then when it comes to actually being in parliament, women will cooperate across all these parties. And you can have women from left-wing merits, women from right-wing parties cooperating on legislation that is to promote various causes of women. And that happens in the Israeli parliament all the time. And this is actually how women have progressed by having these alliances. Wow, so it's not in electoral politics no. where women can come together. It's inside the political yes. institutions. Yes. That's fascinating. Um, so there was a, a nationwide demonstration just a couple of months ago in Israel uh, that brought women from every social sector out into the streets to oppose violence against women because there had been uh, a very tragic series of murders of young women from different communities. Um, do you think that that, that changed uh, 
people's perspective at all? Do you think that it did create a sense of shared purpose or uh, shared need for a political coalition of women across these party lines? Certainly, I mean, that exemplifies the ability of women across party lines, across sectors, to come together for a cause and to mobilize for that. And you're likely to see that reflected in parliament of women coming across political parties. But you're never going to have a woman from a right-wing party leaving or not voting for the right wing because the left wing is taking up the cause of violence against women. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see these coalitions for a particular cause, and that's how they're going to be able to make a breakthrough because you're going to have women across political parties responding to that, promoting legislation, as indeed they did, but it's not going to change the political divisions the primary identity is still going to be over issues of conflict, security. No National Women's Party. Even if it is, it's not going to, it's, again, it's not going to... To move the ball. Exactly. Okay, so before I open it up to your questions, and um, let me give you a heads up that the policy here at AU is for AU students to have the first crack at asking questions. So I see a bunch of students in the room. I'm gonna ask you folks to be thinking about your questions now and to come up to one of these two microphones on either side of the room. Students, first in line, please. And we'll get to your questions in just a moment. So before we open it up, um, I wanted to ask you, Anat, if you were back in the Knesset yeah. uh, with a feminist agenda, what do you think is the most important policy change? Sometimes we talk about quotas for female representation. Um, in Israel, they talk a lot about the role of the chief rabbinate, and you discuss that in your remarks. Um, what do you think would be the most important, most impactful policy change to advance women's equality in Israel? So there's no doubt for me that the primary policy would be to get rid of the chief rabbinate. Get rid of it completely. Completely. And for me, it's part, uh, it's part of a broader vision. Um, I say that uh, very few, basically most political terms don't sound well in Hebrew, which is why we tend to use anglicized or what we call the Azi terms Alfredo, yes. yes, you know, Greek terms to speak about yes. politics. There's one term that sounds fabulous in Hebrew, and I think it does because it is the essence of the Zionist revolution, and I call it the transition from Rabbanut le Ribbonut, <laughs> from an age of the rabbinate to an age of sovereignty. Now, the Zionist revolution was not just about having a state for the Jewish people, that's in many ways a basic, it really was about a revolution in Jewish life to be a sovereign people who are masters of their faith. Now, the idea of rabbis as figures of authority is relevant for people in exile. Rabbis as people of authority were able to keep together a people in exile by adjudicating law and various personal matters. But for a sovereign people, it no longer makes sense. And for me, the completion of the revolution is to truly transfer all authority to the sovereign bodies, the parliament, the courts. Uh, rabbis can be teachers, can be interpreters of religious texts, but I see absolutely no room for them as figures of authority in the sovereign state of the Jewish people. So okay, and, and I think this is a wonderful, um, moment on which to end this conversation and open up our wider conversation because you have just given us the perfect illustration of how your Zionism, your feminism, and your atheism weave together. So Inadville, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, let me invite you now to come on down to the microphones. And before you, come on down. Before you ask your question, please just introduce yourself. Hi, 
Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. My name is Eric Muir. I'm a graduate student here at uh, American University, and I'm a Pickering Fellow, so I'll be joining the F U.S. Foreign Service after graduating. Mazel tov. And uh, I would really like to serve my first tour maybe in Israel. Um, I have two questions. The first question is, we see really today in feminist circles, even by some Jewish feminists, a really strong criticism of Zionism and what Zionism means for intersectional theory or like the ethno state and, and truly how those ideas can be compatible with a, a multi-ethnic plural um, ideal. And then my, so my question is to you, how do you envision a progressive form of Zionism and feminism together? And then my second question is, there's a body of research that shows that women um, have, like when more women leaders are incorporated in a government that uh, they are less likely to go to war, have uh, ex examples of aggression, um, lessened aggression. So how do you feel like an increased number of women in Israeli politics could maybe shape the way the perceived occupation is and, and um, other forms of aggression if, if women are better incorporated in government structures? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'll start from the second part. Um, I once read a great piece that said, the notion that women do not engage in bitter competition uh, falls apart when you think of two sopranos at the Met. <laughs> so um, uh, it's, the question is always, you know, are they isolated or are they part of uh, something bigger? Um, I don't know about, you know, causality and connection in that research. I can say that still in the context of Israel and the conflict, uh, being a woman has no impact. It has no impact on views. As I said, the, the dominant identity for one will be whether they're Jewish or Arab, whether they're right wing or left wing and you're not going to see a difference between women on that part. Um, so I, I don't see how having more women will n necessarily affect that particular idea. I often participated in various efforts to bring uh, Arab women and Jewish women, Palestinian women and Israeli women, and I can assure you that we yelled at each other as much as the guys. <laughs> And so there's no, I mean, I, I know that it's a lovely idea, but at least in my experience, it is not borne out in reality. The dominant identity in many ways is that of the tribe. Uh, and whether you are a woman in the tribe or a man in the tribe is not one that, um, that has uh, effect. Uh, what you're describing about the rise of anti-Zionism in certain progressive circles, such as uh, the Women's March and uh, under the idea of intersectionality, is to me one of the most troubling uh, developments that is taking place. First of all, intellectually, because uh, I think this is an intellectual tragedy. Uh, we talked about the Enlightenment ideas. There is literally, I think, almost no more similar movements than Zionism and feminism. Uh, I, I even wrote a big article on it, if you ever want to look it up, on Zionism and feminism. And what I chart is that they essentially have the same trajectory. They both emerge from Enlightenment values. They both are about the claim of a dispossessed, marginalized, discriminated, group that was structurally positioned on a lower rung in the ladder uh, to claim equality, both individual equality and collective equality. And the story of anti-Zionism and the backlash <coughs> against feminism is the story of the power structures that continuously try to reassert themselves when groups who were on a lower rung dare to claim equality. So for me, it's literally the same trajectory and those are the same movements and they're cut from the same cloth. What we are seeing is 
the rise, and that's a separate issue, the rise, of course, of anti-Semitism in the guise of anti-Zionism. And the problem is that anti-Semitism is historically a very powerful political tool for creating alliances across groups who otherwise would find it very difficult to cooperate. Uh, so they can all agree on one thing, that the Jews are to blame, and as a result, they can create broader coalitions. And I think in many ways what we're saying is a certain uh, laziness to hatch on to that incredibly powerful tool in order to create broad coalitions that otherwise would have to work much harder to create those coalitions. So I think we both need to expose the intellectual fallacy, but also the sinister element of what is taking place underneath. Thank you, and uh, let me hasten to add that although AU students get first crack, that doesn't mean that they're the only ones who get to ask questions. So if others of you have questions, please feel free to come to the mics and we'll go over to this side. Hi, Ms. Wilf. Hi. Work? Oh. Um, I'm, my name is Joshua Anthony. I'm a freshman in the School of International Service here. And first, I just want to thank you for coming. And um, secondly, you actually answered my question that I was going to ask by answering the other question. So I kind of came up with a new one on the spot because uh, I didn't want to sit back down. And the question would be that um, you know, one of my key, one of my core beliefs is that knowing your opposition and knowing uh, not, you know, the enemy is a bad word, I suppose, is, is the first step to reconciliation and making peace. And um, I was inspired by what you said about how women in Israel across the political spectrum seem to come together in the Knesset, you said, um, rather than beforehand. Can you, um, we, I also learned a lot as I've been learning more about um, the Israel-Palestine conflict that um, I learned a lot about peace proposals that men have made, uh, Ehud Barak, um, um, sorry, Bill Clinton, yeah. people like that. And um, could you speak a little bit to peace proposals that women have put forward and how they might be different? Thank you. Um. So again, I, I hate to not play into this lovely notion that soft, caretaking women will make peace. I know we all want to believe in that, and, and, and it's, it, the problem is that I don't see it anywhere. So other than, than wanting to believe in that, it's not something that I've been able to experience anywhere. Um, I mean, I can say, for example, that, um, that as a member of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee, which is uh, in Israel mostly the Defense Committee, and it's a very testosterone-filled committee, but I can say that because I was a bit outside of that group, I could have a different perspective. But I can't tell you that it was necessarily a more loving or gentle perspective, but it, it was different. Uh, so I don't know that necessarily women would somehow have different proposals. I can tell you a lot of my work and, recent, and research in recent years has made me somewhat more of a hardliner uh, in understanding the deep causes uh, of the conflict. Uh, but it's also a different perspective. So is the fact that I'm a woman helping me think differently, but not necessarily more softly or nicely or necessarily assume that there's no conflict. So um, I, I don't know that women making peace necessarily is going to bring different outcomes or do something different. And we have, as I said, women on the entire political spectrum, we have right-wing, pro-annexation, settler women, and we have left-wing, opposing the occupation and settlement women. Maybe we bring a different perspective at times, but it's not necessarily one that we should always assume is nicer, kinder, and gentler. You know, can I probe you on that just a little bit? Beyond the gender dimension itself, you worked very closely with Shimon Peres. Mm -hmm. Shimon Peres was perhaps the, the, the leader of Israel's founding generation that was seen by Israelis as the most 
into peace, the most uh, almost um, uh, almost idealistic about peace. What did you take away from that experience about what it takes for an Israeli leader to sell peace to a security-minded Israeli public? <sighs> wow. <laughs> um, over the years, um, I think the experiences in the last 25 years of negotiations or non-negotiations. Or, but 25 years of whatever it was, uh, have led me to think that I'm not sure even if I can tell you that he engaged in wishful thinking or whether he actually knew how hard it is, but he knew that it's really good for Israel to always appear to seek peace. Uh, that's where I'm not sure where the balance lies because I have no doubt that he knew that there is a tremendous benefit to appear to constantly seek peace even if it might not be possible, that there are benefits to Israel to that. Um, did he really think that it was possible? I'm not really sure ab about it anymore. So Fascinating. Okay, yeah. thank you. Can you can talk a lot more about that. Sir. Yeah, hi, Inat. Hi. My name is Bar. I'm the Israel Fellow here in American University, the Shaliach. Uh, here in the university, I work with students, uh, for example, uh, like both the students that spoke now, uh, and ask you questions. So uh, my question, I will say that you became one of the most influential speakers on the issue of uh, Palestinian refugees and UNRWA. Uh, I want you to understand that from her tweet uh, just recently about a month and half ago, there was like a small conflict between the German, uh, um, like the German diplomatic and the Israel diplomatic on the issue that you exposed. Uh, the fact that Israel supports uh, the money includes uh, for uh, UNRWA. I, I just uh, came back from APAC and they say a lot about the issue of UNRWA. And they say that basically if money doesn't get to UNRWA, uh, uh, the Palestinian aid, uh, basically someone else will put some money. And those money that someone else is going to put maybe is not the best thing for us. Uh, this is uh, a remark that I didn't saw in, also in your book about. Uh, what happened if, uh, if the money that, uh, basically the money that goes to UNRWA is not the money that we want? Uh, or when you advocate basically to take out the money from UNRWA, it's maybe impossible that other people or other organization or other country that we don't want will put their money over there and will go to the wrong hand. So uh, if you can talk a little about that. So first I promise that when my book comes out, uh, I'll come back and we can then talk <laughs> about this at length. Uh, I'll answer briefly because it's less about uh, women in politics. Uh, I will just say, and I said about some of my experiences, uh, I have come over as a result of many analysis and experience to the conclusion that at the core of the conflict remains the Arab and Palestinian idea that Israel is a foreign and temporary presence in the land and therefore anything that can dissuade them of the notion that we are foreign and temporary will bring us closer to peace. And therefore what I talk about on these issues is less about money and more about how the international community wittingly or unwittingly uh, supports, sustains, funds a Palestinian vision that despite the fact that the war ended 70 years ago, they are still refugees from that war and that Israel is temporary and that they will one day uh, take back Israel. So what I talk about is that we can only get to peace when the fuel that sustains the idea that Israel is temporary is dried up. But money can go in, but not in that way. That's a brief answer. We'll talk about it more at length later. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Elon Berger. Uh, I'm a freshman at uh, School of Public Affairs. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, given your experience as a labor member of Knesset, what is the future for the Labor Party in Israel? There have been lots of surveys out that the youth in Israel are increasingly more on the right wing. 
uh, and then also tying that into how you've said uh, you've become more hardline in your views, so uh, the Labor Party in the future. So the Labor Party in this election has basically completed its transformation into merits, which means that the Labor Party has completed its transformation in this election into a small, uh, supportive support party, not a main party, a party of good parliamentarians, activists, concerned about issues, but no longer a party that can make any serious pretension to be a party of prime ministers or a party that leads the country. So this election really in many ways seals the deal of the completion of that transformation. There are many reasons for that transformation, but the main reason is one that I alluded to here and also has to do with the fact that only three gen ex-generals are able to mount an opposition to Netanyahu. Israelis as a result of the fact that repeated peace offers were not accepted, that they were followed with awful uh, violence against civilians, have come to the conclusion that what used to be the mainstay of the peace camp, that if we hand over territory, we will get peace, that that equation has basically failed and that this is a deeper existential conflict about our very existence in any borders. And as a result, I think the general mood in Israel today is that basically we need prime ministers or parties that understand the reality. And labor doesn't seem to be anymore the party that seems connected to reality. What is this reality from the Israeli perspective? That the Jewish people or the Jews of Israel are a tiny, 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 in one tweet I said, did I say tiny, ethnic minority in a dominant Arab and Islamic region where defenseless and unarmed ethnic minorities are slaughtered, and that the rest of it's commentary. And that leaders who do not demonstrate that they understand that before anything else will not get the support of voters which is why only three ex-generals can even mount an opposition to Netanyahu because Israelis look at them and say, okay, they get it. This is very different from whether Israelis are willing to make peace or two states or divide it. I have a, a little uh, kind of thought exercise that I do with very right-wing or settler groups. I tell them this. Imagine that the king of Saudi, as old and decrepit as it is, decides to do a Sadat and come to the Israeli Knesset. He brings with him the king of Morocco and the king of Jordan, and the three of them stand in the Israeli Knesset and they say this. We are here in the name of the proud Arab nation, in the name of Islam, to say we're done. We're, it's over. We will no longer fight you not by military, not by terrorism, not by boycotts, not at the UN, not on campuses, we're done. We accept that you, the Jewish people, are not foreigners. You are an indigenous people come home. That you have a history here. That your language, Hebrew, is a language that is a sister to our own. That you are a tribe of the region and that you have come home. So we are here to tell you, welcome home but we do expect you to divide this land and get out of the West Bank. At that minute, Israelis will run into Israel within the Green Line, and the three settlers who think that their way has won and Israel is now right wing will look back and find no one. Why? Because at the end of the day, we are keenly aware of the fact that we are a tiny, tiny, tiny ethnic minority. <laughs> And if we are accepted into the region as equals, not as a powerless religious minority that knows its place, that, that they're always willing to accept us, but as a sovereign equal people of equal standing of a state, 
And the price of that is the territories. The price of that is the settlements. The price of that is partition. Of course we will pay that price. We have paid it before. We will pay it again. But we need to know that then it's over. Thank you. Please. Thank you both for being here. I have two questions. Introduce yourself. Oh, okay, yes, <laughs> sure. I am not a student, so think of me as the, the first of the wave of everyone else who has several questions. Uh, I'm a recent graduate from American University uh, SIS, Masters in International Relations. My name is Bruce Pearson. I work at the Center for Israel Studies. My first question, I really appreciated your comment on the collision of multiculturalism and feminism. I think that's very insightful. Do you think maybe were we to develop or nurture a different framework that that, that discrepancy could be improved somehow? My second question is, do you have any comments on the presence and the influence of women in, in the um, in the sphere of journalism, political journalism in Israel. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll start again from the second one. There's no doubt that women, and I think this has been an international phenomena, have really risen to prominence in journalism, media. You see them in front and in the back. And this has also translated into politics where more and more journalists have entered Israeli politics and we have a few prominent female politicians who have been in journalism. So that's uh, certainly been a very welcome development. Mm -hmm. uh, the only place where I still, like I put a caveat on this development, is that there's still a sense in journalism is that you, you ask the questions of the people who actually do. Uh, so we will let the women ask the guys who do things what they're doing. Um, so it's been a great development, but it's not instead of the fact that we should be, see more women in positions of power uh, in politics, municipal, and uh, in economics. On the dilemma of multiculturalism and feminism, which I think by now is not just an Israeli dilemma, you see it across many, many places. I have a colleague who says that every time that he hears multiculturalism, he knows women are gonna get screwed. Um, and, uh, and there's no doubt that this is, because multiculturalism of celebrating Hanukkah and Christmas, that's easy, you know? It's like, that's nice, that's fun, you know? The real dilemmas are always everywhere on the status of women. That's really where it comes across. And it's in a variety of ways because anything from genital mutilation is presented as culture. Child marriages, which, you know, I hate that term. Everyone, anyone tweets child marriages. I'm like, child marriages is when two kids in the kindergarten play marriages. These are socially sanctioned enslavement and rape of girls. They're not child marriages. Um, but these things are promoted by countries and places as culture. But it's the women who get hurt. And many times women in that, and you even see it in the massive debate about wearing hijab. You saw it right now in New Zealand when the prime minister wore, and you had massive debate. Was that a son of respect? Or was she adopting a sign of female subjugation? Or can a woman choose a hijab or not really? Is it really her choice? We're seeing that in so many aspects. Generally, my tendency is to be a militant feminist. That's my personal tendency because I, my experience has been that there's almost been no place where, you know, it's always presented as we need you to show understanding, we need you to show sensitivity, and then it always comes to bite us. And then at one point, when you feel that you've shown sensitivity and respect, and it comes to bite you, then you don't want to show sensitivity and respect, and you become the militant feminist that I am. Um, so in my view, I think societies, and certainly Western liberal societies, should be very clear 
that the value of equality of men and women is a superior, fundamental, liberal value that will not show understanding and respect and sensitivity to cultures who do not accept that. So that's my view. You know, in a way, it goes back to the point you made earlier about the zero-sum nature of power. Because unlike uh, other marginalized groups in society, women are not a minority. We are, in fact, a majority, <laughs> a slight majority. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, but that in and of itself means that true equality means that men have to make room. And that is inevitably threatening, right? Yes. Thank you. Laura Cutler, the Managing Director of the Center for Israel Studies. Um, I just wanted to bring it back to the topic of, of today, which is women in politics in Israel today. Um, with the election coming up on April 9th, um, you talked about the three generals as being really the only possible opposition to Netanyahu, but it's also the case that across the political spectrum, some of the most exciting voices that we're hearing about are women. Um, in, in this country, we saw American Jewish women voting much like Jews did in general, which is vast majority, not for Donald Trump and for the Democratic Party, but you have quite um, a spectrum of women that are really at the forefront of all the different parties. So, I thought perhaps you could address if there's anyone we should be watching in particular or their influence in the election. Thank and you. And before you answer that, Anat, if I may, I, we can certainly take your question. If you, why don't we take these two together? I and did. I, I, I oh, brought okay. her question into my thought. Do you have something else? Oh, I, um, because then we need to wrap up. Okay. Marlene Connors, I'm a friend of the center, and actually Laura touched on what I was going to ask, because I see um, historically Jewish women in America voting as a block. Um, and as Laura mentioned, the majority of white women in this country voted for Donald Trump, except for Jewish women. And it's surprising to see that the women in Israel are not more liberal and voting as a block, and I just wanted you to respond to that. Thank you. So I could make the argument that Jewish women are voting as Jews uh, because they vote like Jews, which overwhelmingly vote Democrat. And that actually in many ways confirms my point that the tribal identity uh, is the one that dominates the gender identity. Within Israel, that means whether you're Jewish or Arab, but because, uh, you know, I give a lot of talks on what is a Jewish state, but one of my favorite definitions, which is not mine, is that the Jewish state is the one state in the world where Jews actually control the banks and actually control the media and, you know, actually control politics. So, um, so because the tribe is the country in a way, then you're able to have women spread across the entire spectrum. But that, the, the tribal identity still remains the dominant one. In America, <coughs> Jewish women vote like Jews. They vote like the tribe they belong to in many ways. So it's not, I think, about liberal or not. It is much more about that minority status and voting for a party that you think would protect uh, what enables uh, a good life for that minority in this country. Uh, in Israel, because it's a different context and it's the sovereign state of the Jewish people, then you will find women all across the spectrum and you will find Arab women across both Arab communists and Arab uh, Muslims and all uh, in various, various Arab parties, uh, the spectrum. Uh, but as a result, really, some of the most exciting women, clearly the most interesting woman in Israeli politics today is Ayelet Shaked. Uh, there's no doubt about it, and she is very right-wing and one that is certainly not easy to digest by those who think that being a strong, powerful woman should go with liberal values. Um, and she's also a, a confusing character because 
She is very much promoting what I know people think would think of as an illiberal agenda, one of annexation, one of supporting the settlement, uh, one of having a very conservative court. Uh, but then she takes a lot of feminist actions, such as promoting many women, and she's promoted more female judges than anyone else. So, so she's a bit of a confusing character, but she is right now the woman who can marshal uh, the most political support. It remains to be seen if she's made a good political bet at the moment in creating this new right-wing party. But for example, when you put her at the head of Likud, she takes more seats than Netanyahu. She brings in more support than Netanyahu. So certainly she's the closest person, if you were to bet on the next female prime minister of Israel, she is clearly the bet that everyone is making. We have very exciting women on the left, the head of Meretz, but again, Meretz is also teetering on the threshold. We have very exciting women in labor, like uh, Stav Shafir and Merav Michaeli. But again, as I said, labor has transformed itself to the new Meretz, a new marginal party. So, and who knows? We have new people coming into politics all the time. Every Israeli Knesset, a third of the members turn over. So we might have new women, uh, new exciting women. But really, I know what's most confusing for people is the most interesting one, the one that has the, bit, the largest chances to succeed, is in many ways the, li the least liberal one. Thank you, Enat. So uh, I'm going to invite Michael up to say a few closing words. But as I do, Enat, Zionist, <laughs> atheist, feminist, yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, thank you both, um, and thank you for your great students, to, to our students, uh, to, to great questions. I'm a little sad, I'm a little sad that you're not in the Knesset and you're not running, uh, and that you're not the UN ambassador, the Israeli ambassador to the UN, but you are an amazing ambassador to Israel, and I really want to thank you. I also have to say that I'm a little, I've, I've, before we started this event and last week's event, um, I'm also a little guilty that our own field um, Israel studies is not so strong in man, and I'm actually grateful to my colleague, Professor Lauren Strauss, for pointing this out and saying, you should do a little bit more on women's issues, and thank you. Uh, so we started, and uh, I'm, I'm really um, sure, even though um, I don't know if you will have a comeback or want to have a comeback as a politician, we will hear a lot more from you, either as a politician or I'm sure, uh, without any doubt, as an author and certainly as a very eloquent speaker. And thank you also, Tamara, for your excellent questions. So thank you. And there is a reception outside. We do have to leave the room. Um, there is another event taking place right away. So there is a reception outside and you're all invited. Thank you all. <laughs>